way to uh, Leon David. The song. Okay, we're on. Um, so next uh, on our agenda is um, the sports panel, the Game Changers panel. Um, some of the uh, America's more notable and celebrated athletes have roots outside of the United States. Sports are bringing a common linkage about, among many diverse communities. The fervor created around the World Cup every four years is the evidence of the ability sports have to activate communities across all countries on, on a global scale. The international development community can channel that interest and energy by engaging these communities, promoting the role of sports in sustainable diplomacy and development, particularly to support recovery, reconstruction, and resilient efforts. Um, I want to, uh, I don't know if, how many of you were here in May of 2011 when, uh, when we did this forum. Uh, I had a panic moment um, uh, as we had a slight delay uh, inviting the secretary to speak and I had to fill a gap. Uh, and where at that point I had to improvise and, and talk. And at that point, since I didn't have talking points, I started confessing about what I loved which was my, my wife and my daughters. Uh, and the, the other thing I confessed was my love for the, for the beautiful game called soccer. And I've got a lot more feedback and thank you for that comment than what I did broadly in terms of that work. So that I knew at that point that that game was much more powerful than all my talking points that I had. Um, so since that you know, incident in that moment, I, um, I've been thinking about what partnerships we can come up with that links uh, not diaspora communities based on their countries of origin, but their passion, which is the sports. There are a lot of soccer diasporas out there. And I recall when I was in college and I, uh, in the campus at Virginia Tech, uh, uh, we used to play in this uh, field called Drill Field. And we had pick up games uh, with people I never knew what they were saying but we had this common language that our feet, our, our feet spoke to each other, uh, which was very much more powerful than the dialect that we can have. And so uh, uh, I'm gonna ask to, um, uh, for Stephen Keppel to join me. Um, and um, Jonathan Matz, where are you? Come on in. Um, we're, we're, I'm glad and, and, and honored to announce a, a new partnership called uh, Das Porta. Uh, which is a cute name. When you put T in diaspora, it became diaspora. <laughs> and, uh, and this partnership uh, is basically aims to uh, inspire and mobilize global diasporas in an effort to build, rebuild communities and supporting infrastructure projects and community programs that engage sports as a, as a medium, as a mode of engagement. So diaspora partners will identify opportunities to support sporting venues, organizations, and programs that serve stable centerpieces for communities struggling or recovering from the impacts of natural disasters, conflicts, or economic difficulties. So it's, it gives me great pleasure to announce our 2013 program centerpiece, which is the Phoenix a Soccer Stadium in Saint Solier in Haiti, uh, which was a commitment made by um, uh, Delos Living at last year's uh, Cl Clinton Global Initiative to build um, uh, uh, a beautiful stadium from the rubbles of the earthquake that happened in Haiti. And we're putting this program together with Univision, which is the, one of the biggest uh, uh, media companies in the country uh, covering the Hispanic community. And if you're talking about football, uh, you cannot ignore the, the power of the Hispanic soccer uh, family and how that could be galvanized for this noble project uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so I think we're working with a video. Is the video ready?
I came here, this thing was like, you couldn't even walk by here. You couldn't even reach here. My name is Robert Duval. I run a youth development program. Um, they call Fondation L'Atlétique d'Haïti. It's a foundation that I have created uh, 18 years ago in 1995. And the intent of this foundation is to make a contribution to society through the youth and through sports and education. In Cite Soleil, we're building a soccer facility. Um, and it won't just be soccer, it'll be a stadium that seats anywhere from 12 to 22,000 people. The design will look and feel like an organic design. Uh, it grows out of the earth. So our approach immediately was to understand what exists, what, what's actually innate in terms of materials. After the, the earthquake, there's a lot of rubble. When we understood this, we, we felt that there was an opportunity to bring bulldozers really, and shape the rubble into hills, sit on the hills and watch the games. It's really almost there already. We're just reshaping it. There'll be ancillary facilities like a school, a youth academy, vocational training, a recycling and composting center. And really it'll be a, a community-based um, facility. There are two approaches, like you say, you, you're an NGO, you, you come and do good, you know, it, you come in emergency, but after the emergency, you're gone. You know, you're not really making a real impact, you're making a, a partial impact. But me, I'm Haitian, I want to live here, I'm going to die here, and therefore I have all the best interests for me to create conditions for the citizens to live a better life. So we, we, we want to build a stadium, a real football, soccer stadium. Thank you. Isn't that beautiful? So I'm going to give uh, Stephen Keppel from Univision to, to say something. Thanks a lot, uh, Tomas, and uh, to everyone here at the State Department. Um, I'm here representing Univision and specifically Univision News, uh, and we're really excited to be here again for the second year in a row. Um, the mission of our company is to inform, entertain, and empower our audience, um, which Thomas said is um, one of the largest and fastest growing demographic groups in the country, U.S. Hispanics. Um, this idea of empowerment, which is an area I get to focus on a lot, uh, which I love, aligns very well with the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance and this project especially. It's um, also a great honor to be here representing uh, Univision Sports, um, who is being brought into the fold and is really passionate about this, this project. Soccer is a passion point, as Tomas said, for many in the diaspora community, particularly for our audience, and our team at Univision Deportes has seen the great potential of soccer to bring people from different countries together and really build community and develop a sense of solidarity. We're really excited that Project Phoenix and Haiti are involved. Haiti's a, a country very close to the United States and to Miami. Haitians are important contributors to the United States, and particularly in Miami, uh, where Univision Networks is, is based. And so we share that community, and we're really excited about this relationship. Um, <clears throat> it's also very serendipitous uh, for me to, to be here and to be at this announcement. Uh, I was actually here for, to participate in a panel this afternoon about La Idea, another initiative. Um, but things kind of felt, came together in, in the right moments, and actually, a decade ago, um, almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, I was in Haiti working on some uh, entrepreneurship initiatives and actually got to meet uh, Bobby Duval, the uh, charismatic uh, leader of this initiative in Haiti, and got to see some of the seeds that he was planting. Um, and 
actually see the, the, the early fruits of, of his labors. I mean, uh, his organization is very well known in, in Haiti, and, and he's a great example of uh, what Haitians in Haiti are, are really trying to do to rebuild their country. Um, back then, 10 years ago, was a vibrant dream, this idea of a stadium and a soccer league and, and all these things. Uh, but now it's becoming a reality, and it's great to be part of that. So thanks very much. Thank you for that. So on that um, passionate note about sports, um, it's now uh, for me to, to introduce uh, the, the next um, panel, uh, which uh, will include very distinguished and uh, well-known uh, sports figure in, in America. Um, so uh, I would like to welcome award-winning USA Today and ABC News Sports, uh, Christine Bernan, um, uh, and her um, uh, panelist is the, the most decorated skater, Kump, which is my also colleague diplomat, uh, Michelle Kwan. Um, uh, James Inigibo, uh, I hope I didn't mess up your name, my brother. American football safety for the Baltimore Ravens. He's local. Give him a round of applause, guys. <laughs> and last but not least, um, my compatriot, uh, Mav Kavlesgi, with Duk Kavlesgi. Marhaba. Please come on in. And uh, it's yours. There we go. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the sports panel. Uh, it is my great honor to be here and to be with these tremendous championship athletes. I say championship athletes because of their exploits on the field of play, and I, as a journalist, have been honored to cover and, and report on all of them, all three of them, one far more than others, and I'll refer to that in a moment. But uh, it is also, they are champions off the field of play as well. And what they do for this nation and for the world is extraordinary. So as I said, it is a great honor and privilege for me to be here today moderating this, this session. And uh, we hope that it is one that brings a lot of wonderful stories and answers. And of course, we welcome your questions and those for people on Twitter. Please send them on in. Um, and yes, I, I guess you can ask sports questions, right? <laughs> but obviously, there's much, much more to talk about here. I would like to first uh, introduce our panelists. And then uh, I will start out with asking a few questions. And we'll, we'll, we will go from there. And again, this is your session. So please direct us accordingly with your thoughts and questions when the time comes, which will be in about a half hour or so, depending on how we go here. I am going to start in the middle with Michelle Kwan. Michelle is the one I have covered more than the other two, uh, the, the gentlemen here on our panel. And it has been an honor and a privilege, Michelle, to cover pretty much every step of your career. And now to be your good friend as well as someone who's reported on you. I once wrote about Michelle, and I dare say it's true of all three of our panelists, ladies and gentlemen, that Michelle has lived her life as if a child is watching. Everything she has done. Uh, as far as I know, as a journalist who's covered her since she first started when, on the world stage, the national stage in 1992, as an 11-year-old, uh, has, has been exemplary. And I think we can say that about all three of these athletes. And I have to say, we can't say that about all the athletes that we come across in this world of ours. Michelle is the most decorated figure skater in US history. For over a decade, 1995 to 2005, Michelle dominated this, her sport, figure skating, like no skater ever before, winning an unprecedented 43 championships, including five world championships, eight consecutive, and nine overall US national championships, and two Olympic medals. In, in the nearly 100-year history of US figure skating, no American man or woman has won more world titles, national titles, or Olympic medals. Michelle's activities off the ice, though, have been equally noteworthy. Michelle joined the Department of State as a senior advisor for public diplomacy and public affairs after six years representing the United States abroad as the State Department's first 
Public Diplomacy Envoy. In this new capacity, Michelle broadens the scope of the department's public diplomacy with strategies to reach larger segments of the world's population, integrate innovative policy and public diplomacy, and enhance public affairs out outreach. Two other notable uh, moments for Michelle in June of 2010, President Obama appointed her to the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And in, also in 2010, Michelle was elected to the Board of Directors of Special Olympics International. Michelle graduated from the University of Denver with a degree in International Studies. And I gotta tell you, while you're figure skating, that is a very hard thing to do, uh, those early mornings, uh, to double, double duty in all ways. And she received a master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Kwan. <laughs> to my immediate left is another decorated Olympic athlete Meb Kowalski. Meb, nice to see you. And Meb, and we will call you Meb, <laughs> uh, is well known as that. Is, he's uh, a U.S. citizen, but Meb was born in Eritrea. I pr pronounced that correctly? And, uh, and still maintains dual citizenship in both countries. Meb, you were the first American since Alberto Salazar in 1982 to win the New York City Marathon. And you did that in 2009. In 2004, Meb finished second in the same race, and that same year also won a silver medal during the Olympic Games, that was in 2004, despite being ranked 39th out of 100 of the world's best marathoners. Talk about your sports upsets. Meb has represented the United States in three Olympic Games and several world championships. At the recent 2012 London Olympic Games that you may have watched, Meb was the top American and overall the fourth place finisher in the marathon. Meb is also the author of Run to Overcome, about his journey from humble beginnings to winning the New York City Marathon. Uh, as we know, your nation, a war-torn country, uh, it is not hyperbole, ladies and gentlemen, to say that Meb arrived in this country with nothing but the clothes on his back. He is the founder of the Meb Foundation, maintaining excellent balance to promote health, education, and fitness. Ladies and gentlemen, Meb Kowalski. And all you football fans out there need no introduction to our, our other panelist, uh, talk about champions, uh, James Ahedabo. James, welcome. James was born here. His parents are immigrants of Nigeria. He was born uh, and he was raised in Amherst, Massachusetts. He later attended the University of Amherst in Massachusetts. There he played college football and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology. And this is where he started to uh, earn a place in our national consciousness in sports. In 2007, he entered the National Football League as an undrafted free agent, signed with the New York Jets. He played for four seasons. In 2011, James signed with the New England Patriots, earning him a spot in, in the Super Bowl, which unfortunately for him led to a four-point loss against the New York Giants. However, redemption. James uh, finally earned his championship ring, his Super Bowl ring, the following years. He helped the Baltimore Ravens win the 2013 Super Bowl against the San Francisco 49ers. Are you wearing that ring right now? No. <laughs> and, and folks, I have to tell you, if he was wearing it, we'd all notice. In fact, you'd have your sunglasses on because it's so darn bright. Um, those, are, those are big rings, and uh, we, will, we will never ask that question again because we'll know the answer. Off the field, James is an active philanthropist and is devoted to serving his people and community through his public charitable foundation, Hope Africa, which helps deserving but underprivileged African students who have a deep determination to excel through education by providing them scholarships to elite American universities as well as providing a network of support, resources, and opportunities in hopes to boost young African leaders for the next generation and generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, James Ahedabo. And as you can see, how lucky we are, how fortunate we are, and Connie and all of you, uh, thank you so much for um, putting this together, for everything that you've done to make this such a, a special, special day. We, we really appreciate it. I think I'll start, and um, I don't know which order you want to go in, but, but I'll let you athletes decide that. Uh, well, let's start at the beginning, because I think it's interesting probably for all of us to find out what made these people tick, how did they get started, what was their upbringing like, 
What did their parents tell them, not only about sports, but about their heritage? Uh, and uh, Mab, why don't, we, why don't we start with you, if you want to just fill everyone in a little bit on how you were raised and uh, how sports and your heritage started to mesh at a very early age. Thank you, and it's a great honor to be here. Uh, obviously, as most of you introduction, I was born in Eritrea, um, and the war was pretty bad, so we decided to, my dad has to walk 225 miles to Sudan, and eventually he made his way to uh, Italy. We lived there for about a year and a half, and then moved to the United States, but my dad goal was to just better opportunities for his kids, both my mom and dad, and when we came to the United States, they said, you have this opportunity that we didn't have, your uncles didn't have, your cousins don't have, so don't waste it. And they accept, expect us to get really well grades, A or B, otherwise it's not acceptable. So for me, Ronnie started in seventh grade, uh, just in, uh, started in sixth grade and then seventh grade, you know, I wanted to get A in classes. And the teacher said in P class, if you run hard or pretty serious, you will get A or B, and he gave that to the whole class, and well, I want to get that A, and I ran as hard as I can. And if you are in seventh grader, if you break six minutes and 13 seconds, you get this A grade t-shirt and your picture on the gym. And I ran at five minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and that earned me to get the t-shirt, the A class, and uh, recognition about France, because at that time I didn't speak English. I just came from Europe. I was uh, wearing a lot more tighter clothes, and uh, <laughs> people m made fun of me, and uh, it was difficult, but at the same time I wanted to get those, you know, whether it's math class or history class or ESL, English as a second language, I wanted to get A, and, and the rest is history, and immediately right there, he couldn't believe his watch, and he called the high school coach, which happened to be Ed Ramos, and says, we have an Olympian here. And that's how my running started. And heritage-wise, our parents uh, expect us to know where we come from, uh, but also learn about the United States and take advantage of it and associate yourself with good people. If you do hang out with, my dad always says, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. And we surround ourselves with good people who were knowledgeable or who were friends and uh, help us assimilate to the culture. And once we did that, they were willing to help us. And you know, everything, even though I might run 26.2 miles now, but there's a lot of people that help me be who I am. Just like uh, Leah said, you have to surround yourself with good people and rely on them and help, help, help you be successful. And that's what my journey has been. Great, thank you. Michelle, Michelle why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your background growing up, your childhood at, with Chinese immigrant parents uh, in the uh, Southern California area. Well, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to mention that it's Christine's birthday today, so <laughs> I want to wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> um, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. My parents, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my parents immigrated from Hong Kong and Southern China um, in their early 20s, um, basically sort of with nothing but the shirt on their back and a seed of hope. Uh, Meb and I were talking about sometimes that seed of hope is is priceless. It's it's a vision of of the American dream, um, having an opportunity for their families and for my in particular my pa family. My parents um, wanted their kids. Um, I have two si a brother and a sister, two siblings, um, to play in sport. And, and they knew the value of sports, the lessons that you can learn of teamwork and hard work and dedication and discipline and focus um, and never giving up. And we were involved in a variety of sports um, growing up. And um, it, it was one of those things, skating is something that I fell in love with. Uh, but at home, uh, I could see that my parents, um, looking back, I could see my parents were really assimilating to the American culture. Um, I still. We still kid with my, my, my father because um, he says, oh, I never was formally educated. He had five years of education in, in Guangzhou, and that's kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, and that was the extent of his, his education. 
Um, so he always says, my English is not so good, my Chinese is not so good, so I speak bad Chinglish. Um, but I, I do speak Cantonese, um, and I'm still learning. I'm, I'm, my husband, in fact, uh, speaks Mandarin, so I hope that when we have kids, we'll be able to raise our kids uh, speaking Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, I grew up having a, a Chinese restaurant. Um, my grandparents uh, and my parents uh, managed a restaurant Golden Pheasant, um, which we ate Chinese food, we celebrated Chinese New Year, um, and spoke Cantonese at home. And uh, I guess that's it's one of those things that um, I bring into um, different parts of my, my life, is that I bring my family and my Chinese heritage with me as I represent the United States and um, work at the State Department as well. Uh, working on certain issues um, like Women Lead, for example, which is the consultation of people, people to exchange uh, between two countries, between the U.S. and China, um, in different pillars of science and technology and, and culture and sports. Uh, so it's not only my own personal upbringing, but it's also something that I take with me um, every day. Thank you, Michelle. And James, how about... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, first and foremost, I'm definitely honored to be here um, amongst these, you know, fellow decorated athletes. It's, you know, definitely an honor to be here. Um, me personally, yes, my name is James E. Hedibo. Uh, my family, we're from Nigeria. I was actually, I'm the youngest of five and I was born here in the United States along with my other brother, David. Um, my mother and my father, they were from Nigeria and they had the pursuit of higher education. They knew that the education that they were receiving in Nigeria, even though it was you know, valid and good, it wasn't you know, worthy of a four-year degree. And so in that, my parents wanted to achieve a goal of coming to the United States and said, how can they do that? How is that possible being from a small village of you know, Umwaha, um, which is in Abia State, uh, Nigeria, coming to the United States with, with nothing? Um, my parents worked diligently at that. My father was first to come over where he can't, went to um, a ministry school, a seminary, sorry, and was there for a couple of years. And then my mom then followed with my two siblings um, at the time, Emeka, Nathaniel, oh, and three, sorry, and my sister, Onyi. And that was their first time in the United States. Um, my mom actually wrote a book about the experience called Sandals in the Snow. And the title came simply from, you know, being a Nigerian immigrant family coming to the United States and it be snowing and not being prepared for the snow. Mm -hmm. So essentially wearing sandals in the snow. Um, <laughs> but with that, you know, that experience, it, you know, was one of determination, um, one of, you know, excellence. It taught me that, you know, as a child growing up, you know, my parents both earned their PhDs in education throughout the process. but they never let any stumbling block, any road determine their goals. And when I would sit there and say, okay, well, I was born here in the United States and my parents worked to come you know, from Nigeria, so there's pretty much nothing that I can't accomplish because I have the resources to do that. And that's a mindset that I've always taken with me is that you know, my, my dad actually used to say, to whom much is given, much is required. And so if you set a standard of yourself that you know, I'm blessed so I can bless other people, so that must mean I have to work harder so I can bless more people. And that's truly what my parents did. Thank you. And that's truly what my parents did in being able to come and earn their PhDs in education, but then go back to Nigeria and start a school to help other students you know, do the same. So that's kind of... Thank you, all, all three of you. You each mentioned, as of course we talked about, your roots, you mentioned sports, and I'm part because I asked you to, um, but also because you're known first and foremost because of your exploits on the field of play and in sports. And I'm curious, and I'm guessing our audience is a little bit as well, about to what extent your multicultural heritage, your family background, uh, helped you succeed in sports. Uh, what, was there anything in particular you can point to from your background, from the way your parents taught you, that can help us understand why you became so good at what you do. 
uh, go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. Go. Well, my parents always emphasized the education, and my dad, in fact, used to wake us up at 4.30 in the morning to learn the English language and make us watch cartoons or go over the dictionary. And for me, the culture heritage was, in 2002, I did my first marathon, New York City Marathon, and I was doing really well. I wanted to win it, and nobody has done since 82, like Alberto Salazar, and in nine, you know, 20 miles, I made it with four people, but Worst scenario, I can finish fourth. Best scenario, I could win it. But then I got, I hit the wall. There's an imaginary wall where you just, you are really tired. Your, your mind says go, but your body says no. And every step was a struggle, and I finished ninth. And those guys that were ahead of me, they put four minutes on me, which is almost a mile. And, somebody, and I told my coach at that moment, I never want to do this again. But then two weeks later, I went back to Eritrea for the first time to visit. And I saw where my roots was and how people were working hard. They would have to go three kilometers or two, uh, two miles to just get a water out of well. And for me, I chose to do this to raise and get paid for it. And here are people just barely finding enough to put food on the table. You got to go miles away to get wood so you can have fire. You know what? I realized that then I don't have a lot of room to complain. And that was a turning point for me. And I came back to the United States and I told Coach, I want to do Boston. And he says, well, not so fast. I ended up doing uh, Chicago where I finished seventh and became the, I improved by two minutes. And that qualified me time-wise for the Olympics in 2004. As early Christian mentioned that, I was the 39th fastest going in to the Olympic Games out of 101. But if you believe in yourself and you set your goal to what you want to accomplish, there's nobody that can stop you. I had a choice to do 10K, which is easier, six miles versus 26 miles. But I decided I want to help with the U.S. resurgence of distance running, and I chose Athens, where the Olympics started, running the original from uh, marathon to Athens, and it was just it's going to be equalized with a tough course, and the hard work and the determination, the commitment that goes with it, it allowed me to perform and came home with a silver medal. And it gives me a great honor to the land that gave me the opportunity to be who I am. And if you believe in yourself and surround yourself with good people, then things will work out. Uh, growing up, my parents. Uh, even though we were involved in a variety of sports, uh, skating was the one that I was very passionate about. And um, I knew from a very young age that my parents sacrificed a lot to give me the opportunities to play. Um, I remember very specifically when I was around nine or 10 years old, um, an argument that my my parents had with my grandfather, and my grandparents uh, weren't able to assimilate as well when they immigrated to the United States, so they don't speak English. Uh, but I, in their Cantonese, in Cantonese, they were going back and forth about how much uh, my parents were spending on the sport of figure skating. Both my sister and I were skating, and my brother would played hockey um, and tennis and other uh, sports. But it costs a lot of money and for my family, immigrant family, uh, to put food on the table, raise three kids, uh, to work two jobs, the restaurant, and my father was also in the telephone business at Pacific Bell. Um, it, it was very difficult and I remember my dad just adamant about giving my kids opportunities that I didn't have in China and that was the end of the conversation. Um, and looking back at the sacrifices my parents made, um, at 11 years old, I remember not having, um, my skates were, were run down, and you have to get a new pair pretty much every year. Um, my feet was growing, and I said, Dad, I need to change my skates. And that's when my father looked at, you know, my, my mom was like, how are we gonna afford a couple hundred dollars to provide skates and equipment for our kids? Um, somehow he managed and he, he was ecstatic and I was ecstatic because then that means I could continue to skate. And 11 years old, I was already at the junior levels um, going up to the senior levels, uh, the senior level. And I, I tried on my skate and my dad goes, you know, these are uh, 
customized skates and it's great and I was just happy to get skates so I was putting them on and I thought god how how did my dad get custom skates if I haven't even tried or gotten fitted for for skates then I realized I turned the skate upside down and it was like scratched out it was like another girl's name. <laughs> and I realized how much my parents sacrificed to give us the opportunity um, to, to play. And, and I think that's something that I will take with me for the rest of my life is the, the word appreciation and that you have to ha be determined to work hard and, and to also know um, that this is, is, is an opportunity for you to do something, something positive in your life. And, I didn't know it back then, but skating gave me a chance um, to travel around the world, uh, to connect with di different people from different backgrounds. Um, I traveled to Korea, China, to I competed in France and Germany, and and then now the lessons that I learned in skating and in sports and the opportunities that it provided also expanded to my role as a public diplomacy envoy. So I traveled for six years and as an envoy and connecting with youth around the world and using using sports to facilitate the conversation. You should see the, the faces of the kids when suddenly I talk about figure skating or I talk about football or marathon or running or they just it's a immediate connection and, and that's the power of sports um, that I realized that I was I was um, lucky to have in my life and, and also take those experiences um, and the things that I learned from my family um, to what I do now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, one of the key words um, that was used throughout is, you know, the sacrifice. Um, sacrifice that was made and to see, you know, my parents that they had to work you know, one during the day to go to school at night and then vice versa, go to school at night, work during the day. And to really see that effect as a young child and the kind of the determination, the motivation, the dedication to providing a better life for your family um, kind of lays that foundation as, you know, this is what hard work looks like. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, you hear all the time of people that want to achieve so much, um, but, you know, what are you really willing to pay to achieve? What are you really willing to give up to, to be successful, to, to accomplish your dreams? And, you know, I see that firsthand as an example from my family, from my upbringing, from our culture in general. I mean, you can, you know, see the number of NFL players, you know, that are of, you know, African descent, of, from Nigeria, that are flooding into the NFL. And, you know, because we share that same characteristic of, you know, what does hard work look like? And you can only say that by looking at your track record of what have you done to accomplish, to get where you're at. Um, of course, we all know that nothing is handed to us and, you know, everything, you know, is truly given, but you sacrifice a lot to get there. And, you know, my parents did that for us as, as kids when we, you know, used to pick cans on, you know, Saturday afternoons, um, you know, just so we had extra money, you know, to be able to go grocery shopping or whatever it may be. Those are things that are inrooted in me that, you know, when it comes to the fourth quarter of a game and, you know, we need a, you know, big play, I can think of times, you know, like that. That if, if you talk about crunch time execution, that, that's crunch time execution right there. Your family, you know, not having what they need, the necessities of what they need and doing whatever it takes to be able to provide that. And, and having that instilled in me allows me to trigger those things in a second. Those, those things, those extra motivations, those extra boosts that, that everyone here spoke of that helps them get over the hump, that helps them achieve what many say is impossible, make it possible, you know, it's truly a sacrifice that was laid by my parents and, and, and other Nigerians as well. 